I'm uh, Colonel Carlos Alford. I'm, uh, you know, as it says, uh, Division Chief for uh, Cyberspace Force Development on, on behalf of uh, General Jameson, the A2A6, who's our functional authority, or she's a 17X functional authority, and uh, Major General uh, Kevin Kennedy, who's our functional manager. Uh, I just uh, th thank you for taking the time to uh, come to this session. I've uh, been out on the road giving this uh, brief. I think I'm on, uh, I've done it about eight times now, uh, different locations uh, around CONUS. Uh, I still got about six or seven more to go, uh, but I have uh, had some very interesting uh, conversations and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been uh, fun, is all, all I can say. Uh, I'll give you where we're at, run through these things, our uh, structure. I'd ask again that you uh, um, save your questions till the end. It's only about five slides. And relative to time, I'll, I'll, I'll shrink the story a little bit. Um, ideally, you've seen these on our uh, Mill Suite page, along with FAQs, so that we'll be able to get to questions that haven't been asked before. That would be the ideal. Questions that haven't been asked before and affect a wider, a wider range of folks. And then anything after that, I'm happy to take the one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, what about me, my situation kind of questions. I'm happy to do those afterwards, like I said. So our current state of affairs, when we talk about career field transformation, inside that oval, you see many different things that uh, a, 17, a 17D currently would, can be asked to do, or 17X can be asked to do. And I'm, I'm representative, along with some older folks in the room, are representative of all those things that you could be asked to do. And so, you know, for me, uh, my, my, my story, I, again, I've done several things in there. My story starts at Ramstein Air Base where I was started out as a deputy flight commander uh, for maintenance, okay, 170 something people. Um, and then I was asked to stand up a contingency systems flight, i.e. WICP, uh, which uh, you'll find out we're gonna make WICPs great again here soon, what I'm tracking. So, and, and that's, that's my, kind of my point of uh, departure, you know, as my first assignment as a lieutenant, an ace lieutenant it was called back then, okay. And so after I did that tour as a, uh, as a uh, contingency systems flight commander, my group commander asked me, I, I assume I did an okay job, he asked me what did I want to do, all right? And so at that time, I made the only choice that I knew to make, which was I want to run the network control center. So if you're old enough to know what a network control center is, you'd know why I was asking to do that. That was probably the place where you could have the most fun inside a building uh, and doing things. And uh, so my group commander was in a comm group and he said, you made the absolute right choice. He goes, you start as my executive officer on Monday, okay? <laughs> so, so I did that, I did that for about a year. Then he sent me off to uh, air control squadron out at Loop. So did some uh, base comm, expeditionary, air control, a little bit more expeditionary. Spent a couple of years out at, out at Loop doing that. And then I was uh, asked to go to the uh, White House Communications Agency. Again, more expeditionary, five-star hotels, but expeditionary, I promise. So it was, that was a lot of fun, all right? Did that for almost three years, a little short of three years. Then I was asked, not asked, I was told, um, to go to Barksdale Air Force Base and do Air Force Network Operations. There was only one problem. I, I didn't know what that was. I, I had no idea. But I went to Barksdale nonetheless. I learned that, learned that piece, and for those of, those of you that are young, uh, FNAT Ops was the beginning of what is now 24th Air Force by, by another name. It's where, it's where it somewhat started at. There's some plank holders uh, around for that. And so I, I did that, and then I went off to an IDE program uh, for, for a couple years, and then I went on uh, to my uh, first command, RAF Molesworth and RAF Falconberry, uh, where I was asked to do base communications as well as part of my squadron was a, a uh, DISA long haul node that uh, provided um, major communications into Europe and then further downrange. So, so I did that again, base comm with some long haul uh, DISA stuff. Uh, after that, uh, through luck, possibly, I was sent to the Pentagon to work some personnel stuff uh, for a couple years. And my reward for that was to go back out to be a commander again out at Al UD, where I, again I did base communications and had a big DISA long haul uh, node as a uh, part of that. Uh, after I left there, I went to the, down to uh, War College doing advanced warfighting school for a year. And then I went to uh, U.S. Cyber Command. Now realizing I hadn't done the FNET Ops, as you see, a couple of assignments. And then back into cyber where I was asked to be a planner in, in the J-5. So I did that. And after that assignment, they brought me to the Pentagon to do what I'm doing now. So 
my, my career represents a few things in there, but there are folks that have been asked to do even more. Along the way, at that particular time, I was asked to be good at all of those things. But as I culminate, if you will, at this point, you know, I, when I tell the tactical equipment that I worked on uh, across, uh, across these uh, sessions, most of the folks haven't even heard of the tactical equipment that I worked on. Anybody even know what TriTac is? How many? All right. Okay, that's not many. Um, so, but that's how much things have changed. So obviously, I'm not an expert in tactical comm anymore, right? Uh, I, I consider myself still okay with uh, base comm. I think I could do that. And long haul DISA stuff, I think I could do that. But what this represents, uh, again, that I'm representative of what's in there and, and why we need to change, where we're going to ask you to be really good tactically and technically competent at something, all right? That's what, that's what this is all about, okay? And so we're changing the career development plan signed in September. That's what, that's what we're trying to get after. Informed by mission analysis, some studies um, from Rand and, and others. And so that's, that's where we're at. Most folks have seen this slide. Um, it's made it to Facebook, has some memes. This is how you describe to your family how you fit into cyber, you know, different things like that. Um, we are going to have two distinct Air Force specialties, 17D and 17S. That's real. That's coming, and it's coming fast. Uh, by the end of next month, uh, by 1st of October, everyone will be designated one of, the, one of these, uh, one of these uh, AFSs. Now, under with the two AFSs, you're going to have a, one career field manager. That, that is me. You're going to have one functional manager and one functional authority, the folks that I mentioned earlier. So that is fairly common. One career field manager, two AFSs. That's because these AFSs, we believe they are uh, more closely related than some people uh, like to believe on some days. But they will all end up uh, going to Keesler uh, for initial skills training. So uh, the other piece, we expect uh, for 17 Ds uh, between A and B shreds to be able to flow in between. All right. We have started doing the analysis on how many billets exist. Started it with expeditionary communications and OCO because we figured those were the smallest, so we know where those requirements are at. And we expect it, again, to flow between the two uh, based on those requirements. Now, if folks start out in expeditionary, we got to figure out what that development looks like, you know, whether they're going to bounce back and forth or whether you're going to grow up. And then we have to figure out, kind of like missileers, if you've been around a little while, they, they reach a point where at 04, you got to break off and do something. They usually cross flow into other FSCs. We wouldn't cross flow into other FSCs, most likely. We would just uh, start bringing those folks up the network operations uh, track, strictly network operations track, because they already have that experience. Being expeditionary in itself is not the skill. It's being able to, it's having network operations experience, being able to employ it in an expeditionary environment. All right, it's just so we're clear on that. Uh, 17S officers will largely remain in their shred. Right? And I say largely. There will be some opportunities, but I, I fully expect uh, DCO officers to flow into OCO, then more likely OCO to flow out. And the reason is, as of today, the large investment that we put into some of those OCO officers, two and a half years, uh, to get them uh, qualified uh, to operate. So to, to do all, then make that investment and then let them go do something else, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow right now. But uh, that's based on some uh, title, for those of you who are familiar, that's based on some Title 50 things. But as we expand our Title 10 capabilities, we might be able to uh, adjust that model. All right. Uh, formal avenues will, will exist for uh, cross flow. And it's, it, within the career field, it really won't be cross flow. The Air Force has a cross flow board. That's usually other AFSs coming in. For us, it'll be much like what we'll experience uh, the end of next month. It'll be a, a redesignation board. It, and with that redesignation board, if someone's uh, redesignated, they will get the requisite training so that they can be fully functional in whatever AFS they get redesignated to, right? So it'll trigger, it'll, it'll trigger, that, tr trigger that training. And the important thing there to consider is there are going to be many folks, even after next month, some people will get exactly what they want, some people won't. That's just the reality. Uh, it'll be informed by requirements to a certain degree. Uh, but if you decide as a captain, a mid-grade captain, six years or so, you want to flow or re be redesignated into another AFS, that training gets triggered, okay, and you go down that pipeline. Well, whatever that is, you're going to be a six or seven year captain and behind your peers, right, because now you're just flowing into that AFS. So you're going to be somewhat behind, not as far behind someone coming into the career field 
who has never done any of it, didn't go to the same IST or anything, but still behind. So those considerations have to be taken for your career progression, because you could be cross-flowing and capping yourself. That's just, that's just reality. But as long as it's informed and you don't mind, it's okay. The board will have to understand that as well based on the decisions they make, because they're more likely to, I would think, we haven't established this yet, um, they're more likely to cross-flow a younger person, right, who has more time to, to catch up, if you will. So along this entire path, as we, just as I highlight expeditionary uh, communications, keep in mind everyone is expeditionary. Everyone in our Air Force is expeditionary, so you're not excluded uh, from being expeditionary. And even when we talk about OCO, no matter how you have it pictured, I can tell you that JSOC, JCU, goes to the schoolhouse and recruits folks to bring them into that world right from, uh, right from the beginning. So um, it's not as pronounced, but it is still, uh, still there so that those opportunities uh, exist. The Z prefix, how, how did it come about? Again, not cosmic uh, in any, any way. The Z prefix was used, is used by uh, Combat Com and ENI uh, to classify or designate engineers. It's the only uh, prefix in the category that we own. That, that's why we used it. And there was about 40 folks that it was in use for, and we expect when we do this uh, designation of the folks that will get that AFS or get that prefix, excuse me, uh, we're probably in the 70 or 80 range right now. Uh, but we do expect there to be expansion, that, that cyberspace engineer. We're still working through what that Air Force classification uh, directory guide, what that definition of that uh, is. Um, uh, so what you'll see out on the Mill Suite page, you'll see draft uh, Air Force classification guide information for the two 17Ds and 17S while we still work through the Z17X. But uh, it's, again, it affects a very small uh, population, if you will. So. The paradigm shift. How we primarily have viewed since the since the inception, since we started doing this, we've been looking at units that do things, right? OCO unit, DCO unit, DOD unit, or network operations. That's how we've viewed things. As we try to shift the narrative, we want to talk about the people in units that are doing things, right? So that is a, that's a big shift. Not that what we were doing was wrong, but as we try to transform, um, we have to think a little bit differently. And the example I use is I talk to an ion. Just It's not a scientific study, but I talk to an ion. And I said, hey, who operates your network and can, secures your network? He goes, I do. Okay, all right. I'll go, well, who defends your network? He goes, I do. I go, but aren't you tasked with getting through all of that and creating effects on the other end? He goes, yeah, that's, I, I do all of those things. Everything up there he does. So I said, what if we had specialists that operated to secure the network you operate on and then someone that defended it so that you could spend maximum amount of time getting through to the other side to red space to create effects? He goes, that'd be cool, okay? That's just one sampling of, of how we see things. Um, we see multiple AFSs in our, in our units. And then the sample down at the bottom, you see the cyber squadron where we'll have MDTs, where we think there will be DCO, net ops, and expeditionary, as I talked about, making WICPs great again and all of that business. So we expect to have three different, three different specialties down there operating. All right? That's, that's where we're trying to get to. So the people with the right skills in the unit exec executing the mission, uh, allowing us to be more effective as, as units. All right? Our, our plan of action is really a hand wave level. We've been working, we're working through a more detailed POAM, uh, but the stand up of the talent management team or codification of the talent management team. The, the talent management team already exists in some form, but we think there's an opportunity to bring more synergy to what we're doing. And that talent management team is made up of uh, the CFM office uh, at the half, uh, the senior officer matters, uh, officer who concentrates on uh, colonels and GOs, uh, additionally, the assignment team is part of this. The Cyberspace Professional Development Office down at ACC, we believe they're part of this. We believe MAGCOM FAMs have a role in this as well. Um, and everybody's doing their thing, but we're, we're going to codify how we can better work together so that we can develop you or the officers into the, what they need to be and what, we, what our Air Force needs them to be. So that's, that is ongoing, but we will have a charter 
and uh, get that signed off by our functional manager and agreed upon by the, the powers of being ACC so that we can keep, uh, keep moving forward. The first step, a, a giant step, was a MAGCOM billet review so we can see what requirements we have uh, across those AFSs. Up on initial look, we probably got about 250, 270 on the exhibitionary side. We started on the, the little ones. And then on the OCO side, we probably got as many. Uh, so we started there and we started work our way in because those seem to be the easiest ones to, uh, to identify. But uh, that went out for one round. We're going back out for another round. And what we've asked folks to do was identify the skill sets needed for that, for that billet if a person's sitting in that billet. Is it advanced academic degree? Is it CVH hunt? What, what all the things do, do they need? Is it exhibitionary warfare school? Whatever skills they need, if we identify it on that billet, then when a person gets assigned that billet, the requisite training will kick off, right? That'll identify that person needs to get this training and they'll get in the queue. I think we, we do something like that, but it's much more manually intensive, um, if you will. So that's, that's the first way. And then you should have received by now and should be aware of uh, the My Vector uh, update where we're asking you to go in and document any, anything in your record that's not, not there. Whether it's a, a job that you've had downrange, okay? Uh, if you were a flight commander down at one of these uh, deployed squadrons, then please go in and type. It might be in your records. It might be a single line on an OPR buried, not, not easy to see. And so we're asking you to go in and, and pronounce that. And there's instructions on how to do that. And then on the education and training side, the same thing, right? So if you've got a certification or something that is not readily uh, apparent, please go in and document that also. It might be an SCI on your record. Um, and that reminds me, we'll probably have, I went through all the SCIs in the last three weeks or so. There's like 89 pages of them, about 10 to 12 per page, so it's quite a few. And I tried to parse out which ones apply to us, but my main point is not everybody has those memorized. All right, so when you're looking at that surf and you think, well, I got all nine of my SCIs on there, but you want to make it easy for the board, and we're going to try to use my vector to do that. And my vector's turned out to be a very powerful tool for us to manage you all uh, as a force. And as you go in and update, you've probably seen some changes to the drop-down menu. We've been actively updating the org codes, the function codes, and the, and the job codes that you can actually fill out. So please get out there and do that as soon as possible. And if you have any trouble, check the FAQs, open a ticket. I'm probably getting about three or four of those a day where there's some kind of problem where somebody can't do something. I'm trying to correct them as, as quickly as possible. Uh, next thing is the half board. Everybody get the my vector message. Anybody here not get the my message, my vector message yet? That's good. All right, so that's going to determine how you get designated. And it'll be based on your training, education, uh, some of your experiences, but it'll be leading with those education and training uh, to, to start with. And that's why if you look at the draft AFOCD uh, inputs that are posted on uh, Mill Suite, you'll be able to go, okay. All right, no, I fit that, I fit this or fit that, and you'll be able to put that down. And it should make sense, it should make sense. There will be folks that'll go in and put pie in the sky. They've been doing Doden ops or network ops for 10 years. They're like, but man, I really wanna be OCO. So I'm gonna put it down, all right? That's probably not gonna be helpful unless you've got some kind of hidden gems in your record that we weren't tracking some education and training uh, that we weren't tracking. And I'll give you an example. I did have one uh, officer tell me during these road shows that says, hey, what if I was doing OCO, I was assigned to a 17D billet, and none of my OCO work was ever documented in any of my OPRs? What, what can I do with that? I, I, I can't do anything with that. So it's important, not just today, but always, to make sure the, the work you're performing is representative of in your record because that's what we have to look at most of the time. But if you do have any additional training, make sure, make sure you're documented. That bo board will occur the last week of September. We've given everybody a voice. That happened three road shows in. People kept asking, I told the boss, people keep asking, how do I get a say? So you all have a say now. Um, when, he, when he was asked, he goes, he points to me and goes, figure out how to make sure they get a say. So, um, and then I had some smart folks that figured out how to, how to do it in my vector. So that, that was a win. And then the commanders get to endorse. So that's a good thing, right? Um, but last week of September, and we will also figure out how to notify people. I mean, the system will notify, but if you don't get your 
don't get your choice. We will have a, uh, an appeal process that will be open. So, but it needs to be informed. It can't be, well, I asked for OCO. I have no OCO experience, education, or training that will get me there, but I still want it, and I'm appealing. That probably won't work, but if you have all the backup and your senior rater says yes, then, then we can have that discussion, and we have been tasked with having that discussion down to the each So I got tasked this morning to figure out how we're going to do that, um, but calling people. Uh, so make sure um, you have a way to be contacted, your best way to be contacted uh, when you do your uh, my vector. So I just offer you all are getting that first. I had to, I uh, called back to the back to the staff and said, hey, we need to update the message so people put in their contact information so we have a way to talk to them while, possibly while the board's going on if we have any questions. That's how serious uh, uh, both uh, my, my boss, uh, General Kennedy and uh, General Jameson are, are taking this. They want us communicating uh, throughout the process. Uh, DT and assignment team will uh, will adopt this process. Will everybody move come next summer? Uh, no, right? That's not possible. Um, I did get asked that. Well, does it mean that the entire career field or a bunch of them will be moving? No, it'll probably it'll happen over uh, over over a period, probably two to three years, to get everybody in that right right assignment. So, um, and then new accessions. I, I I dove on that grenade. Um, there's a way. Right now, it's if you've been commissioned, it's class rank and your choice. That's the minimum going in. And I said, boss, I don't feel comfortable with that. Can we work on some kind of aptitude test or some kind of screening to make it at least a little bit more informed? All right. An, an example I use is, you know, if I've got two, two uh, cadets, they're sitting at Rensselaer Polytechnic or, you know, possibly even University of Texas, let's just say, um, and they're, they're one and two. And they're both equally qualified to go do one of these AFSs, and they both want, we'll just use OCO. But under our current construct, one of them could randomly get, the number one grad's probably getting what they want, but the number two grad may end up not with, not with their number one choice, even though they may be more qualified than other folks out in the grand enterprise, whether they were a number one or not. So I, I, I struggle with that, which is why I want it to be informed by an aptitude test, and we, that's, that's, uh, that's been in work as well as we have some screening mechanisms to, to screen that. So that's why I said, hey, I'll figure it out. We don't have it today, but we're going to establish it. And the idea is we get it all the way back to the accession source. I, I figured out USAFA. I figured out OTS. Haven't figured out how to get it to ROTC uh, with expediency. But the main point is you will leave your commissioning source knowing whether you're a 17S or 17D. That's the idea. Good, bad, or indifferent. Yes, we're just moving it far left. But I believe it's a lot less consternation if you find out at your commissioning source, you know what you got, and you're going to figure out how to be the best, best one of those things, you know, as you lead up to that. And you know the additional things you probably need to study, uh, self-study, uh, to, to be good at it. And already talked about flowing into progression uh, billets. And then ATC will modify training, and they look to start doing that next spring. And the only thing I can say right now is we believe it will be a common core. I'm calling it a common core where 17 Ds and 17 Ss will have that phase one. They'll be together. And, but what I don't know is what it will look like on the other end, well, whether we will have two phase twos for the different things or three. Uh, what does that look like? Will DCO be paired with uh, net ops and security because those are more closely related? Or will DCO and OCO be paired together? I don't, I don't have that. There's a series of uh, working groups that are happening over the next few months that'll, that'll work towards coming up with that, those uh, ideas. All right. So... Ran through those. This is where we're at. Air Force needs more depth. Um, that's what we want. We want to build tactical and technical competence toward a strategic, uh, operational and strategic end. And so that we believe this is the right way to do it. So what I'm charged with, I'm going to try to do that to the best of uh, our ability to make sure we do this smartly. You've seen the five uh, AFSs, or excuse me, four, uh, four AFSs as well as the, the Z prefix capability development, shifting a mindset from types of units to the types of people in those units, okay? And then the strategic leaders informed by operational experience. And what I say here is, you know, my, my boss, is, he's a B1 pilot, all right? He's the functional manager for cyber. Why? I asked, was he, or I don't know if he was good at cyber. I did find out a week ago he does have a SISM. That's probably more than most certs than half the people in the room, possibly. Don't know, but he's a bomber pilot. Now, he grew up tactically focused, all right? Well, he wanted to be a fighter pilot. I always like to say that, but he, he didn't make the cut for that. So with that in mind, right, he became the best B-1 pilot he could be. 
uh, weapon school, uh, on the SAS, so on and so forth, vice wing commander, wing commander, and, and here he is. But what the Air Force has done is trusted him that he put that effort in and as a bomber pilot, became as good um, as, or if not better than most, and they've trusted him to do something else. And so that's what I'm trying to provide for you, or that's what we are trying to provide for you. Become really good at what we ask you to do. Not okay at many things, like what I started with, right? Be, be good, you know, we're not asking you to be good. We want you to be excellent at all these things, tactically and technically uh, competent. That's what we want. And then from there, you go through those other opportunities, whether it's WIC or other, other schools and uh, other ASG programs. I always like to put in a plug for ASG programs, SAM, SAWS, MOS, uh, JAWS, and a, and a few others, right? So to help build that strategic mind on your way up uh, to being a senior leader. So that's, that's the story in a nutshell. The fun part is the uh, questions that I think you might have. Uh, if you haven't, if I haven't answered all your questions and uh, as we went through the brief or you haven't already seen them. So that's it. Like I said, five slides. It's about right. It gives us about 20 minutes for questions. I, again, I ask that you ask questions that you think might affect anybody. If it's just about you and your very personal situation of, I'm happy to answer that offline. Who, who wants to go first? Okay. Mm -hmm. Developing software capabilities, but mm -hmm. we're kind of in the NPC or in a non development like AFSC. Um, but we all have a, somewhat of a background with that. Right. And how could we document that on my vector if it's not formal training? Uh, have you taken the, um, the cyber language self assessment? No, sir. I don't, I don't even know what that is, sir. Okay, so I, that got sent out through my vector. So if you've been in my vector, you should have a notice sitting right in front of you when you log in that says, take this, okay. and we'll. That's our first step is to be able to document your, your computer language skills. And then towards the end of the year, we're working on an effort to uh, be able to uh, determine if you actually can do the things you said you could do. It's very similar to the language piece. Yes. So you say you can speak Russian and you're good at it. You take the actual test and you can have a seat. You're making me nervous. Um, <laughs> um, and then you take the test and then we go, okay, documented. They can do what they said they can do. So we're working through that along with a cyber language uh, aptitude battery some things like that that we expect to have by the, by the new year. But the first step is that, because we can pull that data and I can make sure that data is, is available. The other, the other piece, if you go back to the shred, um, or excuse me, the Z prefix, right? That's open to 17D or 17S. That's not exclusionary. It shouldn't matter where you're at. Another aptitude or screening that we're trying to figure out, how do you screen into that? Um, because not every, just because you can do code or, or you can do a computer language, can you do it in the manner um, that's required for those particular uh, positions. So we're trying to figure that out as well because some people go and try to do it and they're not good at it. So they have to be off ramp to, to other things. But that's the first step is that's uh, uh, computer language self-assessment. Again, in my vector and everyone should have received a DM on that through my vector. Go ahead. Uh, Ken Miller, Air Force Spectrum Office. I got a question that's being asked to me by a lot of member <coughs> folks in, in the career code and that's with regard to command opportunities. Yeah. Will we see the C prefix 17 command opportunities be designated for Ds or Ss, or will they be allowed to free flow among different uh, command opportunities? Uh, free flow is not the term I would use, but the top thing that I will tell you, I'm a, I'm a policy guy, and so I'm trying to be good at policy. Um, I'm always happy, to, commanders hire commanders. So they can hire whoever they want. That's, that's that. But I would like it be, to be informed by the development that, that, we're, we're, that we're trying to do right here and right now. So obviously, if you all don't know, and I didn't highlight it on the slide, but over on the network ops side, that's a preponderance of leadership opportunities, all right? That's just real, I, this is math. So even last night, I was trying to figure out how many opportunities are over on the 17S side. And so I went through, I found four commands, squadron commands, for 17 SAs, uh, S, for OCO, so I found four. Over on the DCO side, I found six. That's real, all right? Um, then I went on and go, well, what squadrons could they do both? Whether it's WIC, aggressor squadron, a few
few others, Operation Support Squadron, so on and so forth. And I believe there were six more plus six more squadrons, therefore six more DO opportunities most likely. And then there was two debt, debt commands, so two more 04 leadership opportunities. So whatever that math comes up to, roughly, you know, 16 uh, 05 command opportunities and 18 04 leadership opportunities, that, that's real. That'll probably be our point of departure uh, for the hiring authorities as we do the DT. And most of those are owned within the NAF. So those folks typically attend the DT. So they will be making their hiring authorities, I mean, making their hiring decisions right in the room in most cases. So they don't have to go out and consult anybody. Uh, where they, they'll have the opportunity if they see folks over in another area, 17D, that they need, then that's what they'll do. Now, just as we talked about, you know, different folks, different skill sets, could I see a mix of 17D and 17S in different units? And will commanders may want that mix, especially as we get down to cyber squadrons, right? That's the potential. Or other, or other units, whether it's a schoolhouse where you might want that mix. All of that I expect to happen. You know, you get into how, you, how are you gonna figure out how to alternate and make, make sure it all works where you have, don't have the same uh, AFS uh, in DO or command, and that can all be figured out, but I, that's the way I see that going uh, for the near term. Oh. Yes? Thank you very much for this discussion. My name is Karen Vitiri. I'm a professor at the Air Force Cyber College right here at Air University. I'm very interested in the force structure and training uh, that you have established. I wonder if my read is correct. It sounds to me like you're looking for specialization without scope typing. I wonder how it compares to what other great powers are doing in terms of their force structure and training. That's probably a bigger question than you want to answer right now, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit about your point about Air Education and Training Command uh, expanding and stepping up its training, and to what degree do you see education, such as the Cyber College, would be involved in playing a role? <coughs> All right, let me see. Uh, I haven't been asked that one before. This is a show number eight, so. Uh, the way I think about that is on the AATC side in itself, just as I described, they've been tasked to redo the curriculum uh, to meet the requirements of, of this uh, specialization. And ideally, they'll send uh, an airman out or an officer out that can do something when they show up. They don't, you know, there'll be some OJT involved, but uh, we would like our lieutenants to be useful when they show up and not just show up a, a lump of clay or why do we have them in school for six months if they're just gonna show up as a lump of clay. That's one piece. When it comes to the cyber college, I think there's a larger role uh, that we're trying to figure out um, with regard to how it all plays in the continuum. I did have uh, Colonel Blackwell, the 81st Training Wing Commander. She's actually, um, we're gonna, I'll call it federate something out to her. She's gonna take a look or assign someone to take a look at our training, our, our training and education continuum from once they leave IST, because that's gonna be covered by Colonel Miller, the 333rd Commander, and, and take a whole look at that and come and do interviews, figure that all out and come back with some proposals you know, so that, each, so that we know that each one of these things build on each other. And then additionally, what is the cyber college role or what do we see the cyber college role in there? So what I, I will do uh, based on that, I'll make sure that uh, cyber college is not left out of that discussion, accidentally or otherwise. You all already provide inputs to our cyber 400 uh, course and some other things that may or may not be picked up by the 39th IOS where there's MDT uh, type things. So we, we gotta figure out how that's all synchronous. Because right now, much like the talent management framework, if you will. There's good things happening, but it's not, it's not synchronized, and that's what we wanna to try to bring some order to that. And then when I watched General Holmes brief today, uh, wasn't the first heard, but I heard it from a four star, so it made it more real than all the rumors I heard about an information warfare training wing, right? So I'd heard that, but again, it came from him, so now I was like, whoa, you know, what, what, is that, what does that look like, and how do, we, how do we bring that to bear in this, in this uh, training continuum as well? Mm -hmm. Really good, green is bad. But a cyber guy steps off keyboard for three months and comes back, everything's gone. It's all burned, everything's changed. Even the network completely changed. 
how are we addressing that through policy to make it okay to leave a lieutenant or a captain in position on a weapon system for six, seven, eight years? Um, that's, that is the brief, right? Exactly. Tactically and technically competent. And probably today or sometime this week relative to me getting the document, I'll, I'll sign off on an assignment policy that says all lieutenants leaving UCT will go to a unit. And the follow-on to that is they will have back-to-back -back assignments in their specialty to help us get to the tactical and technical depth. By and large, right, there are some off-ramps on there, whether it's AFIT, EW, you know, some other things that people might go off and do, but that will be the, that will be the policy. Again, it's taking some practice, but I'm trying to get, you know, give the team, the assignment team who executes policy, give them the policy they need uh, to be uh, part of the, the goodness that we want to happen. So that's what we're trying to do. I'll sign the policy that says that will be the thing. And, and then whatever exceptions pop up, because there's always a story. I've had nine of them exactly since I've been in the job. Um, everybody has a special story that they're the unicorn that can only do the, this or that. But, but we're, we're getting after that, it's bottom line. Absolutely. So another one of the tasks that I have was uh, for developmental categories. I usually save, let's save that for the last five minutes and, and then I'll go into that. Don't let me forget, but it, it's yours. And we'll talk about development category, developmental categories for promotion and how this all will help us uh, get to good. Any other questions on, on this? It's, it's not a redo, it, it'll be additive, I guess, the way I, way I see it. We, ha we have what we have now. I can't spontaneously, you know, build off of, hey, I'm going to have an MDT in five years. But uh, my, uh, my brother, Colonel Fletcher, who's more or less responsible for that portfolio, he has a rollout scheduled for that. So something, it starts as early as 21, I believe, maybe. And there's pilots and all of those pathfinders, these things. But it, it officially starts, I think, in 21. And so... Uh, that information is what will drive how, how we do the, the billets as we, as we move forward so that it ramps up. Okay, so from, a, from that force development model, you know, we were using pyramids. This will probably be a left to right uh, type of thing where we start over here, at, you know, on the left and we go that first anywhere from uh, one, one to seven, seven and a half years or so, right? So that's where they're gonna gain their tactical and technical competence. As they move towards 04 um, and those that don't go into, you know, DO or any other 04 leadership, and they make their way through Air Command and Staff College, I ideally, and that should prepare them to go work on a staff, whether it's at the Air Staff or a Combat Command in a JCC or a Cyber uh, Operations Integrated Planning Element or, or any of those, those type of things. And so that standard track would, would be part of the development, informed, educated, 
and then on to these things. And then probably, if the, based on the order of, order of battle, if you will, they'll leave the staff and go do one of these things, whether it's 04 leadership or 05 leadership, depending on where, where they're at. Does that, that answer? No, I no, gosh, no, no, no. There, both both AFSs will be required on those staffs. The harder piece is, as just as we're doing the billet review within Air Force, boom, that's gonna that's gonna go. We have close relationship with Cyber Command. That's have a larger pro percentage of 17 Ds and 17 Ss out there right now than any other combat command. So we're working with them, but we got to get down into the eaches because we know each combat command more or less has a joint cyber center and elements within the five, uh, five or three, five, things like that. So getting them to ID what skills they need. Transcom needs a certain type of skill, probably more net ops, net security, defensive focus, and then some other combat commands uh, like PACOM may, may tilt heavily towards 17S, but realizing they both have requirements for 17D. Same thing with USFK. They'll probably have, be more focused on the 17D and net ops, making sure that uh, they can operate out on the <coughs> peninsula uh, effectively. So, so it, it should, it's based on requirements. And I, we're not driving them, we're describing what each skill will do and giving, that, giving those uh, billet owners a chance to describe. Because before this, some folks might say, hey, only 17 S's go out to Cyber Command. But that's definitely not true, having worked out there. Um, there's a range of uh, skills needed out there. Uh, and if you're a planner, if you're a good planner, it's AFSC agnostic, right? I mean, that's the, that's the reality of things. You don't, if you know how to plan, you know how to plan. If you got some experience in cyber, it, it's additive, but from a basic planning standpoint, from a five or a three, five standpoint, you'll get all of that relative to what portfolio you got, just based on my, my limited experience. All right, still, still time, all right. That's right. correct. And so for some of them, um, especially if you didn't do too well you know, in, in that assignment, they want an opportunity to, to, to go somewhere and maybe explore that option. And so if you see that in the commander's comment, is that something that the board will consider or you're pretty much stuck because, hey, you're in tactical comms, so you're well, not. No, it's not quite like that. I, I, don't know, I don't know about weight. What I would offer, if the commander's signature is informed by facts, not a feeling, because a gut feeling is not going to help me. Does the person have the education and training or other experiences that we can't see that ideally I've asked everybody to provide that so that we can see them so that we can make an informed decision. I, 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 would, reckon, I would caution commanders about endorsing pie in the sky desires. When that person says I want to do OCO and they have literally no background, no education and training that could show that they could do that, then that's probably not an effective use of that commander's signature. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's one piece. But there is a reality, there will be an opportunity, I'll call it a course correction. Um, if I have a USAFA cyber warfare person that goes to AFIT uh, for uh, 18 months, then comes to Keesler, graduates, and then ends up at Fort Meade in the 707th installing printers for a living. He didn't pick it, most likely, but that's what he got. So he's cyber warfare, computer engineering masters, and he's installing printers. And I'm going to imagine being the best printer installer there is and most qualified printer installer probably in our Air Force. So when that airman, that officer gets to look and maybe, maybe he's happy and maybe he's like, man, I lucked out. I don't know. I haven't talked to him personally, but he may have said I lucked out. But he'll look at the uh, AFOCD and he goes, wait a minute. I have the education and training to do OCO. Uh, my current experience doesn't say that, but I have the edu education and training and background that says I can, so I'm going to apply for that. 
Commander signs off. Yes, he has edge rushing training. He didn't pick his first assignment. He maybe round him out under AFPC rules. He, they've got 90% of one of their choices and all that business. But, you know, did he pick that? No. So I, I would see those opportunities. This is an opportunity to, to try to bring that to, I'll say right, but it's, it's only as right as what a person wants, right? So that, that's the way I see a scenario like that going, but not just endorsing uh, someone because that's what they want. And that, that'll, that'll, that just requires you know, us being honest with folks, right? Looking them in the face, which was one reason when this first started, I was like, commanders? I go, oh gosh, that's 2,800 different. I can't tell little Johnny or Jill that I'm not gonna be the one to tell them no, they don't get to do what they want, right? So, but again, by popular demand, commander gets to say so. Use it, use it wisely. Don't just use it because you can. You got to be able to look. Say, look, I looked over your records. I looked at your education and training. You have zero shot at this. So you can put it down, but I'm not going to endorse it. I'm going to sign and say, hey, I, I recommend they do whatever. That's what I'm looking for from the commander. Honesty on that. All right. One more question, and then I'll talk about developmental categories. Really? How many have questions about themselves that they'd like to address with me after? <laughs> I got at least one. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> That's, yeah. Oh, I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> That's real. Um, okay, developmental categories, promotion, developmental promotion categories. I consider this a win. So we've uh, been, if you're not reading the news, we're in the information warfare category. I think there's six other AFSs uh, in there, something like that. But what is uh, being allowed to uh, happen is we're being able to describe in two PowerPoint slides and now one narrative. It started out with just two PowerPoint slides and they had a mock board last week. But two PowerPoint slides and one one-page narrative. To the font, can't deviate, all right? 12 font, Times New Roman. Boom, boom, that's it. You gotta fit it in there. I'm moving commas, I'm doing all kinds of stuff to get as much stuff in there. But in there, I'm able to describe the things we value, right? I'm able to describe, hey, we value technical advanced academic degrees from AFID or Naval Postgraduate School. We value that. We value it so much that we would like to identify folks and send them there and pay for them to go to school because we value that. That, we're able to put that fidelity. We value certifications. I'm able to put in there, hey, we value a CSSP, we value a CISM, we value some of these SAN certs, we value that. And it'll change by grade, there'll be some self-development that we expect out of you, right? But we're able to put those details in of what we, ex what we expect, not performance, because what I was, when we first started, the first iteration, we put it, must do really, really well, you know, and that was just taking up space. So they go, kill all of that fluff because the Air Force can figure out if you're doing well based on the inputs in your, in your uh, OPR. So we clean that up and able to put more meat of this is what we expect uh, from our officers and that's starting the type of jobs we expect in the whole as lieutenants, OIC, flight commander, not ADO, just so you know, but anyway. Uh, that's, a, that's been a common, uh, common uh, duty title that the assignment team doesn't put anybody on assignment to, by the way, uh, just so you know. But we're able to describe those duty titles at the different grades, what we expect. We're describing in an environment where you will get one 04 leadership opportunity and one 05 leadership opportunity. That's the environment that's being described right now. Is that how it is today? No, right? So the first iteration I had to describe a mix of, because we have a mix of career fields, I mean, a, a, a mix of efforts with regard bouncing back and forth, different people doing different things, so I described that environment. Uh, but forward looking, I've already started on a separate one for 17D and 17S. Over on the 17S side, I'd expect you to command as, uh, or expect you to have 104 leadership opportunity, um, and then 105 leadership opportunity, probably a commander or a DECO for 04, and, and an 05 opportunity in one of those 16 squadrons that I, that I described. If everybody agrees those are the 16 squadrons, at least from a starting point. So that over on the 17D side, we would probably, under the current construct, we would expect you to command as an 04 or DETCO one time in preparation to command one time as an 05. As of now, the Air Force recognizes 05 leadership, but we have an opportunity to turn all this on its head if we want, because we're gonna get a chance, someone goes up, 
They're getting ready to score 150 records from 17 Ds. And so the brief comes up. This is what we value. This is what you would expect to see. And so they can focus in. And they're looking, hey, they have that, they have that. Yeah, you ask yourself, do we need DOs on one side or the other? I don't know. I know why we have them. I'm very confident of why we have them. Starting about five years ago, right? It was a switch to try to identify with pilots. But if we don't have to identify with pilots anymore, and we only have to identify with our promotion category or our AFSs, do we still need those? So think about that, right? I grew up in a world of, you had two flight commanders. The SEO was number two. Commander goes on leave, SEO, you got it. That's life. And you put in there, ran the squadron really well for one week, whatever you put in your OPR, I don't know. So, so think about those things, and we're taking feedback. Um, I'm drafting it, and it's, a, it's an iterative process, but if you, if you think about that, do we need, do we need these things? I, I, that, that is to be determined. But we have an opportunity to, to flip it on its head from a developmental standpoint, because if I could have the 140 DOs out of 100 of the squadrons of the 146 that we have out there, if I could have 100 of those DOs to do good work uh, at the MAGCOMs, combatant commands, and, and the HAF and uh, SAF, that would be a beautiful development opportunity, much like that was mentioned. Right now, we're short of those 04s that we really need on the staff because we put them all down in the field. And, you know, is that good development? How many times and how long should you be at the squadron? I've already, I'm flipping it. I'm already going to have you down there seven or eight years. So do I have you down there for 16 years? You know, before you see a half, like some of my flying brothers, the first time they were joint is when I was in class with them. It was the most they've been around a joint uh, environment, is in a classroom. I don't think that's what we want. I think we, we want to beat that and have an opportunity to develop folks uh, uh, a little better. And that, so that's just something for us to consider. But the main point on the promotion categories, we get to write what we value, and we get to tell that story. And once it's approved, it will be out there for all to see. It's not going to be cloak and dagger, hidden behind anything. It will be out there. The Navy does it this way. The Army does it this way, which I believe that's who we considered when we were uh, changing things around. But we'll be able to put it all out there and say, hey, this is, this is, uh, this is what we expect out of you. And you'll, you'll see it come to fruition. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be a standalone document for sure. Uh, but many of those things you'll see incorporated into whatever version of the CFETP and or talent management framework, whatever we finally name, the final name for that document. But we're going to bring all those things together so it's all right, at, all the way down to the duty titles. Um, uh, for those of you in the room, we got to stop making up these duty titles. Uh, we got to. They, they add no value. Right? They add no value. You stick to the script. You're either OIC, flight commander. There's no deputy flight commander. Stop it. Just stop. You're OIC, flight commander branch chief, so on, and so, so on and so forth. We gotta get some discipline about that. And I was joking about the ADO piece, but what I've seen happen is they'd make a captain, person depend on captain for a month or a year, they'd make them an ADO, assignment team looks, goes, they've never been a flight commander. And they put them on assignment to be a flight commander. Now it looks like, ooh, ADO, ooh, back down to flight commander. what they do wrong? Ooh, next record. So I, I don't think everybody understands those second and third order potential effects. Uh, when they're trying to do a good thing, and we've all been guilty of it. Before DO started, what, seven years ago, you just changed the duty tile of DO, you know, right? And that, that's had some impacts as well. I saw a question out there. Sir, Major Dower, AU Fellows, just a quick question on the promotion category. So Congress assigned 1,000 positions for Lieutenant Colonel. How did they figure out what percentage is going to go to each of those categories? Has that worked out? Uh, yeah, so they're, 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 doing a, they're doing some kind of formula, but within each category, well, there will likely be a floor that will promote to a minimum. They'll say that category must be promoted to 80% or it, using that as an example. Now, 17s may promote to 85, uh, PA may pr promote to 50, um, 50%, but through all of that, that floor, if they need three PA lieutenant colonels or the world will come to an end, at least three PA lieutenant colonels will get promoted to, to meet that floor. That's kind of the way they're looking at it. But the promotion opportunity will be the same uh, uh, for all. Uh, that's the end of the time that I'm tracking. Um, again, I'm happy to stay back relative to who's in the room next and uh, answer any of those each's questions. Uh, anybody that has a personal question about himself, I can, uh, I can help you by answering or guide you to where you can get an answer. Thank you for your time.